Hey, good morning. <laughs> Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks. You guys are all out of practice. How was it to have the last two Fridays on? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> it's really shocking to be back here at 8 in the morning, isn't it? Sorry about that. But um, we get going early because we have a lot of stuff that we're trying to do. Okay, so I handed back lab notebooks, and um, you know, I looked at them just to get an idea of how you guys are doing with that, and I have some specific suggestions, again, on, you know, after looking at your lab notebooks. I, uh, I put down in red pen an evaluation, sort of a couple sentences at the end of your last entry, um, which gives you an idea of you know, sort of what I think. I mean, I didn't really, if you handed something in, you could pretty much get a B, as long as you, you know, were doing something. Um, if, uh, you know, if I thought you were doing better than average, you got a B plus. And if it seems like you're really on target with the book, then you get an A. Um, but these are all, you know, it's a, it's a minor component of uh, the overall grade. Uh, the quiz is a part of this. And your performance in the lab, you know, your participation, etc. So what we're doing is kind of uh, kind of difficult, huh? I don't know. I think uh, you know this is a, an interesting opportunity. I I don't know. I sort of see it like this. At least this is my opinion, right? So you know, society is this pyramid, and You are here. You're at the top of the pyramid. So that's why it seems kind of tough, and it's a little bit frustrating, right? Because um, to do scientific experiments, it seems like there's this never-ending sort of level of complexity, and um, you know, it's really not clear what's going on. And you can think, well, you know, maybe my professor's not explaining it well enough, or maybe I'm just not the science person, or whatever. But the sort of stuff that we're doing is done by PhD graduate students or PhD postdocs and professors, right? So you guys are undergraduates at the, be you know, really pretty much it's still at the beginning of your your undergraduate careers as sophomores. So um, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to play ball with these guys, and so it seems kind of obscure what's going on. And we, we could run the normal kind of college lab. If you'd like, and you can all have your butts and burner with a little test tube, and you know, it turn, turns the solution turns blue when you eat it or whatever. Um, you can do that, but you know that's not really what's going on in science right now. So uh, we're trying to, you know, give you that background on, on what's going on. So this, you know, the way that we operate in our lab is pretty much the way that the Buck Institute labs would operate, and labs at other uh, universities that are doing research, real research lab. So um, that's why it's going to seem a little bit disjointed to you. It's like, well, you know, it was good enough for me to do this in the other class for a lab notebook. Why is this deal different here? Well, it's different here because this is, we're doing the real thing. There's no sense in learning a bunch of things that are irrelevant. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I think a lot of the college curriculum was designed a few decades ago or whatever, and so they there's still there's momentum to keep showing you the same things. In the meantime, these scientific fields have advanced quite a bit, and uh, the machinery has advanced quite a bit, so they're still like describing how a rotary phone works. In the meantime, everybody's got an iPhone and they're talking to it, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like that. I mean, the, the, the lab machinery, the software, the computers, you know, everything is... Um, it's moved up, and there's no sense in instructing you what happened in 1950, you know, I mean, or, you know, trying to train you to work in a lab that operates like that. We don't run labs like that, so um, it doesn't make any sense. So it is a, it is a lot, though. I mean, this, the exposure that you're getting, this is, you know, the, the stuff on the lab notebooks. I was never instructed in lab notebooks until I got into graduate school, and then um, my thesis advisor, you know, he, you know, would be strict on the lab notebook, and he would collect that lab books. He would write nasty comments in the lab book all the time. It's like, you know, I don't see your purpose here. You know, it's, 
and you didn't record all of the data, and you know, I mean, he was always upset on what was going on in the lab notebooks. So, you know, it would be inappropriate for me to, to act like that, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to do that, but I'm trying to steer you in the right direction. This is important stuff. So, um, just to talk about lab notebook. <coughs> so the the handout that I just gave you is. Um, it's a copy of the syllabus up to the last lab class we had. And in there, I write sort of the, the, what the lab was about, and then the purpose and conclusion. And I give you an example of a purpose and conclusion for those labs. Now, I didn't do that um, in the syllabus because I wanted you guys to think about the purpose and the conclusion. Right? That's a big part of what science is about, getting a clear picture on what it is that we're doing and contributing to that too. I mean, you guys are going to be in the lab doing projects at a certain point. I mean, think about what's the question. You know, what 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 would I like to know about? Why would I design experiments? I want to get an answer, a specific scientific answer. So the purpose is not trivial. You know, I mean, the the result of the experiment is only as good as how clear your thinking is at the beginning. You know, if you have a clear concept of what what it is that you want to find out you're more likely to be successful and learn something by doing an experiment. If you're fuzzy at the beginning, <laughs> spending a couple of hours in the lab, you're gonna be fuzzy at the end. So, uh, so purpose is a big deal. And then, um, you know, think deeply about the conclusions. What did you learn from this stuff? Anyway, so, um, so the lab notebook, let me write down some additional things. Um, so l please look at that sheet, though, on the purpose and conclusions some of the ones that I suggested. There are others, but at least that gives you an idea of you know, where you could start thinking about purposes and conclusions for experiments. So um, some minor things, just looking at people's books. Number one, um, please use a bound notebook. So you, this means you, you can't remove the, um, the pages, right? So I mean, although like a loose leaf binder is um, might seem convenient because if, whenever I give you handouts, you just puncture, puncture some holes and you put it into the book. And that, that kind of works on one level. But um, people uh, kind of insist on a bound notebook. And the reason is it's supposed to be a journal. It's supposed to be um, you know, showing chronologically what you did at what date, at what time. So if you can put in pages and pull out pages, there's no chronology there anymore. I mean, I you know, I changed my mind in late October about what I did in August. So then I put a new page in there for August, and you can write, you know, August on it or whatever. Well, then that's not a journal anymore, is it? I mean, it's just you know, a random collection of pages. So um, these books should be chronological. So people don't want you to add stuff to the journal. You know, uh, they don't want you to pretend that you're doing something in August when you actually did it in October. Um, so okay, so don't uh, don't use loose leaf books. Use a bound notebook. Um, it does make it more difficult to add things, though. But cut and paste. <laughs> you know, if you get a page and you you want to put the protocol in your notebook, which I think is a good idea, cut out the protocol, make it fit into your book, and staple it in or tape it in or you know whatever you want. Um, okay, so a bound book. One thing that, you know, the real professionals, they're interested in signing and date, you know, date the pages. Well, I mean, that's, you know, you guys aren't really exposed to that yet, but I'm just giving you an idea. If you get a job, you know, even during the summer you know, in a lab, they're going to want you to start to sign and date pages in a lab book. Well, why is that? It becomes a legal document. It's a legal document. You did something in a scientific lab, and um, there's a legal claim to what you did there. And so if you discover something in the best case scenario, right, you, you designed, you did something, you were playing around with you know, some cells, and something happened, and you see something novel and you record that thing 
sign and date the pages, you have some sort of claim to what was written on those pages. So that might seem kind of serious. It's like, well, why is this a legal document? It's because you are here in society. I mean, that's one way to view society. There's a lot of people out there. Look at San Rafael. I mean, how many people can do anything in a lab and discover anything? Like, I don't know, 0.1%? You're already at the 0.1%. Nobody's got a lab at San Rafael. Okay? They can't discover anything. They don't have any equipment. They don't have any reagents. They, they don't have a purpose. They're not designing anything. They're not evaluating anything. They're shuffling around and trying to make a living. That's true. But they're not, you know, they're not coming up with anything that society needs that's going to solve problems. So, um, you know, so this whole endeavor of the science stuff is at the top of society. So when you look downstairs at the, you know, donor list to build the science building, it's like, well, NASA's written on there. Why would NASA want to contribute to the science building here? It's like, you know, that's NASA's science money, but it's linked right to the top of government. You know, so the, the connection between scientific accomplishment and government is really tight <laughs> and getting tighter. So, um, you know, so this is, this is important stuff. And I think, you know, a lot of people at Dominican, a lot of students, they maybe have other takes on, you know, what's important. But, um, you know, this is the claim that science can make. There's a lot of emphasis on, on scientific discovery and trying to the ways that we do things. Okay, so other things in the lab notebook. A bound book. Um, an index is a nice thing. Elizabeth put in an index. Yes. <laughs> that was really nice. Did, did they, um, were they doing that in Rollins room? Or? Oh, no. No? Like yeah. I mean, that's a really nice thing because, you know, an index is that page at the beginning which says, you know, what the title of the different labs that you did and then the page number that it's on. So in addition to, to that, it sort of brings up the point that numbered pages, in order to have the index, you're going to need numbered pages. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, just grabbing any old book is not always the perfect lab book because the pages are not numbered. But you know, Vivian here numbered her pages. I mean, Vivian's lab notebook's pretty darn good. Uh, I was impressed. Uh, you know, there are so different people can. You know, you can excel at different things. Like you can do well in quizzes. That's an important thing. You can do well experimentally. Um, you can do good, good work in reporting your, your stuff. So anyway, so um, numbered pages, uh, affixing the protocol. Now, you could write out the protocol, right, if you, if you want to. But it's perfectly acceptable to take a protocol that you've got and include it in a lot of books. Like, look, I did these things in the protocol. Of course, you'd have to mark changes that you made. This is a kind of a, um, it, it's important, but it's a, it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's a point that can't be emphasized enough is about following protocols. Remember I said one of the things you can learn in this lab experience is to follow a protocol. Um, it's really important to follow the protocol because the protocol was written by somebody that's done this experiment before and has spent a lot of time doing it. And if you make a change, you say, well, you know, it says here I need to incubate this for 30 minutes, but I've only got five minutes because I'm getting hungry, so, uh, you know, so I'm going to do that. Well, you need to write that on the protocol. Look, I, I, you know, I did this for five minutes. Is that okay to just change the protocol? Not really. You know, the results are not really going to turn out very well if you make too many changes. As it is, with, with the protocols we give you guys, we've like stretched it as about as far as we can because we're trying to compress you know, a more complex lab into a shorter amount of time. Even though it seems like we've got a lot of time at hours, but still, 
Um, you know, we're doing fairly complicated things. So in general, um, don't make changes to the protocol. There was a, this was a funny story. There was a guy that I um, worked with for a while at Genentech. Um, we were both postdocs, so after we had graduated from graduate school and had our doctoral degrees, you do this postdoc in a lab. And um, we were in Art Levinson's lab, and this guy um, had a habit of, of looking at a protocol and changing the protocol. I mean, he, I guess he felt that he understood things fairly well or whatever. So he would look at a protocol and he would just go down the list. It would be like a dozen steps, and he'd say, well, Step one, I'm not going to use that kind of tube. Step two, I'm going to do the incubation for a different amount of time. Step three, I don't want to use this much reagent. Step four, you know, I mean, I, I want to put it in a refrigerator and, and go to lunch for three hours and come back later. And, you know, so I mean, he made all these changes to the protocol. In the end, the experiments didn't work very well. He was a bright guy and a nice guy, um, but you know, a lot of the things that he did didn't work very well. And then you'd ask him about it, and if you really pressed him, well, what did you do? Um, you know, I mean, his actual protocol was all messed up. Um, so, yeah, so you should respect the protocol. But if you've made a change, you gotta mark that change. This is serious stuff. Um, you know, and I think, yeah, I'm trying to emphasize how serious the whole science thing is. You know, people, contribute billions of dollars to encourage students to get a science and math education, you know, trying to, uh, you know, get people to uh, um, to be educated and to, you know, take positions on these um, these new technologies that are going to help humanity and all that stuff, so it's a serious deal. So these are, these are really good skills, and it's to respect the protocol and say, okay, I'm really going to try to follow this protocol. But if you're forced to make a change, you gotta mark down immediately what what you did that was different. Um, and then related to that is, you know, just make observations along the way. And I didn't see that much of that. You know, like as you're doing something, you see something. Like, well, when I first added this, I got a precipitate, or you know, like it's the solution got cloudy. You know, it was clear before, and I added the ethanol, and and I shook, and it was cloudy. You just make a little note. You know, so the solution became cloudy. You know, sort of a. So I mean, th that kind of stuff. That's all really useful to, for trying to reproduce the experiment. Right. Because if, if, you, um, if you try to do it again, if it works, and you remember that the solution became cloudy when you did it and it worked, right? You see that in your lab notebook. Um, then when you do it again and, and you, know, you're, you add the ethanol and it doesn't become cloudy, and then that experiment didn't work, well, it's, you know, that, uh, that observation it could be kind of critical. Well, for example, nucleic acid, when you add ethanol to it or an alcohol to it, it will um, precipitate the nucleic acid and it will make the solution cloudy. So that indicated that there was nucleic acid there. Then you go through the rest of the steps. If it didn't become cloudy, there's a chance that the concentration of nucleic acid was kind of critically low. So you didn't get any of the nucleic acid precipitating out. So, you know, that's a good observation to make. It's like, oh, the solution became cloudy. And you know, as I was emphasizing with lab books, it's it's not just you know somebody else's journal, some legal journal, but it's yours. You know, it's your cheat sheet. It's your thing that you that you own that you um, you write notes to yourself. It's like, well, why do I need to do that? Well, the stuff we're doing this semester, trying to introduce you to techniques. Right, we're doing different sorts of experiments. We're using different machines. Um, you're gaining familiarity with how to collect data in a lab, in our lab specifically. So you're getting a broad exposure to these different things. But you know, if you've done the experiment here and you do it successfully, then next semester, I mean, you're stuck with me for two more semesters. So 
So, you know, next semester when you say, well, I'm doing my project and I wanted to ask this question about a certain gene and I want to use that technique that we used last semester. Well, then you go back to your lab book and look at your notes. You know, you have a protocol there and then look at some of your notes and then you'll remind yourself, oh yeah, right, that solution kind of became cloudy at that point. So then as you're doing it, you know, six months from now, <laughs> again, um, in the spring semester, uh, but this time for your project, um, you'll know something about doing it, and your chance of success is much higher. So, um, so that's why you want to make observations and record them. Um, it's also good to document reagents. Document the reagents that we use. You know, sometimes um, it's hard to do that in, in the demonstration labs that we're doing because we hand you a tube and the tube says oh, EDTA, trips and EDTA or whatever. And you don't see the original stock bottle because um, if we give you the original stock bottles, there's some chance of contamination because you're new at doing this sort of thing. So we're, we're, we're putting, we're aliquoting a lot of things. But you know, as you move along, there'll be some uh, you know, even if it's in a tube, write down it was provided in a 15 mil tube, you know, by instructor or whatever. But, you know, if you're dealing with a, a powder, chemical powder, write down, you know, Fisher, you know, biochemicals, well, Sigma Aldrich, you know, whatever. And then, you know, the date, sometimes they put down expiration dates and stuff on that. Um, you know, how it was stored, you know, re reagent RT, room temperature. You know, so then you know. So you, you go to do the experiment next semester, and you're like, where did we get that SDS thing from? Was that a solution or a powder? It's like, you, you write down sigma, you know, sigma Aldrich RT. You'll know, OK, this is a dry chemical. We can get that in the stock room. So that kind of stuff is useful. And then, of course, the reason why I gave you the handout is because you need to come up um, with a purpose for the experiment plus conclusions. And that's, that's really a big deal because it's, um, you know, it sort of describes how thoughtful you were in this whole process. You don't think about it much. You're not, not really thinking about, well, why did we do the experiment? What, what could we learn from something like that? Uh, if you start thinking about it, you're going to come up with a purpose. The best time to do that is when you're doing the experiment. How about a month later when I'm trying to hand in my lab book and I want to get a good grade on it? Can I remember the purpose? Not as well. It gets kind of fuzzy. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, you know, seize the moment. Carpe diem. Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, so, you know, while you're thinking about it, record something in the lab book. You know, that's also something about the, the lab book exercise, by the way, is that this was a non-assignment. Handing in your lab notebook should have been, like, no work required. But, of course, you guys were a little bit panicked about it, and everybody did fill in a bunch of things. Uh, you know, but that's not the way lab book works. That's the way college works in 1950. Okay? But that's not really the way a lab Works. You, you don't take it home and you know write a bunch of stuff in there from for experiments that were done a month or two ago. It's too late. It's over. So I mean, try to do that right at the moment. And then if I wanted to see your lab notebook again, which maybe I will or not, but some possibility at the end of the semester, then you know should should not require any time on your part. I mean, work on it in class as you're doing stuff. You know, treat it like this is the document that I'm working on, and um, and then you're you're good. You don't have any other work to do, and it will reflect what you were actually thinking at the time that you did the experiment, what you actually observed at the time of the experiment, not what you thought you could observe a month later. Okay, so that's this thing with the lab notebooks, um, and um, just a. Uh, you know, another mention about what we're doing with the semester. As I said, we put a lot of effort into the beginning of the semester. We were really 
you know, going full steam, I think. You know, we kept you guys really busy and had a lot of work to do. Um, and I always feel with lab stuff that it's important to hit it hard at the beginning because at the end, the effort trails off. You notice how, how few people there are here today. You know, I, I, um, you know, I, I heard um, explanations of, well, the soccer team is playing in Hawaii. Um, there's an away game for the volleyball team. Um, there's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So then, you know, a lot of the people are not here. So the, you know, the, how much time you can spend on the lab stuff does decline towards the end of the semester. And then you start studying for your finals. And you realize that those courses have more credits and things. So you want to spend, you know, a fair amount of time with that. So we're actually sort of ramping down a little bit. We're gonna try to you know, have a little less to handle, but um, there's still plenty to do. The important thing to remember is at the end of the semester, I want presentations from you guys. And you know, this is something that the other lab sections are doing much more of than we are doing. But we find that, number one, it's kind of useful to get used to standing up there and explaining something. And I know different people have different comfort levels with that. But you'll find that if you're called upon to do that, your comfort level is going to increase, actually. You'll gain some. Um, some confidence about being able to stand there and say some things. And you realize it's really not about you. This is what I always remind myself when I'm standing in front of people. It's like, yeah, it's not really about me personally, right? I mean, you guys are here, you're listening to what I'm saying. You want to learn something about how to work in a science lab. You know, you're not really worried about, you know, my personal thing that much, right? So um, that's the same for you. You stand up and give a presentation. We're not really, you know, focusing on you as a person. We're just, you know, I mean, we like you as a person, but we're, um, but we're interested in what you did. And so you're describing what you did, and that's what people are really focusing on. So it's, you know, you don't need to get real touchy about yourself. Uh, and especially in science, you know, when you talk with scientists, they really zone out on the whole thing. <laughs> They're totally into the details. You start showing, you know, slides with results and stuff, and they forget you're even standing there. They're so engrossed in, in, in the data. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's really, it should be an easy going thing. So at the end of the semester, you know, presentation for 15 minutes is, you know, is what we were signed up for. Some way to, to do this. And what would you present? Well, find something that you thought you really related to that we did, right? Something that you think you can describe the process. Um, and then you have some results for it. You have some pictures from the microscope, or you have, you know, some uh, readouts from the plate reader. You know, some points on the plate reader that made a graph or something like that. So you you describe the de the experiment in some detail, what you did and what you saw, and what your data was for it, and why you think that that's an important thing. So it could be anything you want, and it could. You know, you've still got several weeks to go, so we're doing some more things. And so you could choose one of the things we did in the past or one of the things we've got coming up. It's one of the things in the past, you've got some computer files, hopefully, in the lab, right? With some, a couple of pictures or whatever, or some graphs. You know, make sure that you've got a copy of that data. Um, so you might want to put it on a USB drive, or you might want to email it to yourself or something in the lab to make sure that you've got something satisfy that. Uh, again, you know, if you're prepared, that whole assignment will be super easy to do. It's like it's like presenting part of what you've got in your lab notebook already. You know, I mean, you know, that's pretty easy to do. And I'm not asking for more than that. Um, it's easier than me giving you exams and stuff. You know, it's just a chance to talk about one of the experiments that you did that you Okay, so let's talk about what we're doing today. So it's been a little bit of a change in the order. Um, on the syllabus it talks about doing a protein analysis, but it turns out that we are in the midst of doing RNA analysis currently uh, in our lab. So I mean, Dan and I have been working on some gene responses. We see some um, induction of collagen in fibroblasts. We're interested in that because it's, um, it's what happens. 
and starting scarring. And uh, the medical term for scarring is fibrosis. And fibrosis is a big deal because fibrosis, scarring occurs in all parts of the body, not just the skin. But if you get a heart attack, um, the heart the cells in the heart are not uh, healed correctly and they scar. So they'll secrete collagen also, and they'll just, you know, there'll be a, an area of the heart that no longer has active muscle tissue but has a big patch of collagen in it. Well, then the, heart, the heart's not pumping uh, as strongly and as uh, reliably as it was before because of that damage, because of the fibrosis. Um, cirrhosis of the liver, you know, liver damage, the, the liver can scar. So instead of setting up, you know, healthy, liver cells to continue their function and with toxicity. Um, you know, you've got the scarred area and it's, you know, there are cells that were dead and then it just fills it in with some collagen. So it turns out medically, you know, fibrosis is a huge deal. So we're really interested in that. And we're seeing induction of, of what we think is scar collagen and we see effects with TGF beta. So, um, so those are things that you know we want to share with you because the experience in this lab course is supposed to be that you're coming into a lab that has a research program going on. We're not just doing demonstration labs. We're allowing you to participate in what we do, what our lab is actively working on. We have momentum on the system. Um, we worked on it all summer. Brandy was uh, participating for eight weeks of summer. Um, so, I mean, the, the good thing is that because we have momentum, we're actively doing this research and you get a chance to see what that means when researchers are working on a particular question. And then you get to participate in that. So there's variations on the theme. There's a lot of side questions, you know, a lot of other related things you can look at. And those things are not necessarily less important. Any of the questions you can come up with are more important than what we're looking at, too. So, you know, there's, uh, so we're gonna uh, involve you a little bit with that today. Um, okay, and the, the method is, uh, is to look at gene expression. So you remember up to this point, we've done a lot with IHC, which stands for immunohistochemistry, right? So we, looking in the microscope, fluorescent microscope, we looked in the focal microscope also, which um, used fluorescent wavelengths, so it's a focal and fluorescence, um, or the fluorescent microscope in our lab. So we were doing IHC, and we saw effects. So we saw in a plate of fibroblasts that if we stain with collagen um, and we use one of these dyes, we see, oh, there's a lot of collagen collagen one, this is several different forms of collagen. There's 20 something forms, 28 forms or something like that of collagen. So collagen one though is, is the main collagen. That's what's mostly made. Uh, it's the most common collagen. Uh, often hangs out with collagen three. So you know one could ask some questions about collagen three. But anyway, we're interested in collagen one. So collagen one would turn on the fibroblasts. So we've got the fibroblasts in a plate. And um, sometimes there's collagen there. But then if we, we can calm the cells down and get it so that we don't see collagen. But what if we add TGF beta, TGF beta 1, um, then we're seeing collagen again. So TGF beta 1 is inducing collagen levels under certain circumstances. And so this induction of the it's the protein. So you can say, well, you know, you see the you see the protein. And, and doing the IHC is good because it localizes the protein that you see to the round where the cells are. So you get to see a structure. So that's all kind of interesting and a powerful technique. Still, um, we're interested in the induction. You know, if there's an increase in the protein, that means there must be expression of the gene for the protein. And this is where you guys have kind of a weak background still, I'm thinking. So the central dogma of molecular biology. 
Dharmaji is what? Central Dharma. You heard this before. So what is that? DNA can be translated to RNA? Or yeah. Or okay. That's good. So DNA. Well, you didn't quite say it right. But DNA and. You said translated, but. Or transcript. Transcribed into RNA. And then what happened? Translated. And it's translated to protein. So the people that know this will get a few more points in this class and a few more points in molecular biology and a few more points in biochemistry and a few more points in genetics and a few more points. So like multiple classes that you take um, will have this, you know, ha have this piece of central dogma in there. So um, it's, a, it's a big one, it's a big central concept. Um, that was the one thing that they had right when they were teaching, you know, my group years ago, <laughs> you know, about what was going on, sort of the beginning of molecular biology, and they said, you know, well, you know, the process of life kind of can be summarized by this, you know, the DNA is being transcribed to RNA, and translated into protein, that's kind of the flow of information and, you know, how structures are created, so they had that right. They had a lot of other things that were not right. Um, they told us that, well, there's a lot of DNA there. It's so much DNA, a lot of that's junk DNA. It doesn't, you know, it's not doing anything. It's not coding for actual genes. There's so, so many base pairs of DNA, and there's only a couple coding regions for genes. You know, relative, it's a few percent of the genome. So what's all this other DNA, and at the time was thrown out as like junk DNA? Well, that was pretty stupid and pretty obviously stupid at the time, but you know, people seize on these concepts and then, you know, you have to write down that most of the genome is junk DNA in order to get full credit on your exams or whatever. So, you know, they taught us a lot of stuff that was um, foolish and, you know, short-sighted for sure. Um, the other thing that they were big on on cell biology was saying that cells irreversibly differentiate. So they differentiate along a certain lineage and as they differentiate, they're committed to going further and further down that differentiation pathway, and there's no turning back. And a lot of that stuff is a lot of baloney, and you know, again, you know, students that did well, you know, learned false concepts, you know, which were propagated and whatever, so, I mean, humans do that. Um, but anyway, this stuff is right, and this is right today, and it's been right for a few billion years, and it will keep going. So, I mean, this won't change regardless of who's in political office or what language you're speaking or, or anything else. I mean, this is so fundamental. This is so fundamental to life. It's incredibly powerful. So, you know, knowing that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein is a big deal. So then, um, the words transcribe and translate are a big deal because you know we've agreed that we're going to use these different terms to describe what's going on. So, Roxanne, you said, well, DNA, at first you said DNA is translated into RNA. And, ooh, you know, you used the wrong word there for that transition. And so, you know, biologists are kind of sticky about words, you know, because they don't have much else to grade you on. You know? So when you use the wrong word, then it's like, well, big X, you know, minus 10 points or whatever. So make sure that, you know, whenever you're talking about DNA going into RNA, that that process is Transcription, transcribe, or transcription, right? And that when RNA is going to protein, that's translated into protein. Well, why is that? I mean, these two guys are nucleic acids, right? DNA and RNA, they're nucleic acids. So the transcribing is like copying. It's like a photocopier. You know, you go to the photocopier, you put your page down there, you know, it scans across it, it gives you a copy of the page. Well, that's what the DNA to RNA thing is. They're the same structure. DNA and RNA, they're polymers. They're nucleic acid polymers. What's the, uh, the basic unit of the polymer? Nucleic acids, DNA or RNA? Come on, 
subunit? What's the subunit? Just like, what's the subunit for proteins? Amino acids. Amino acids. Good. So you link together the amino acid beads on a string, they describe it as, and then you get a protein. Chop out little pieces of protein, you have a what? Huh? A peptide. Peptide, right. So that's the only acceptable word, peptide, right? You know, anything else is not acceptable. That's why, you know, on this quiz, you guys were a little fuzzy on some of this stuff. And, um, you know, if, yeah, you have to have the exact right answer, otherwise, it, it's not. Okay, so the subunit for protein is a peptide, and the subunit for nucleic acid is? Phosphate, sugar, and base pairs. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a nucleotide. A nucleotide triphosphate, then the phosphates, the tri means three phosphates, and they're whittled down, you lose two of them, and then you end up with a monophosphate. So um, they're linked together. Nucleotide monophosphates are linked together, and by cutting off the, the other phosphates, you're releasing energy, so that helps catalyze polymerization, drives the whole polymerization. So, I mean, we're talking about this because this is what the lab's about today. I mean, we see that there's an increase in the collagen protein. Okay, so we see an increase over here. We add TGF beta, we see collagen is turned on at the protein level, right? But now we're chasing this back and saying, well, if, there, if there's more protein, that means that the gene, the DNA, the gene, the gene for collagen, um, gene for collagen is transcribed into RNA. So you're going to get collagen RNA. And that RNA is translated into a collagen. So at the gene level, the gene must be turned on. So we're turning on the collagen gene. deal because we're in the age of molecular medicine. You know, molecular medicine says that, okay, if we understand the molecules that make up living things, we can understand disease and we can treat and possibly even cure diseases because we understand that at a molecular level. So that's the whole orientation of medicine currently, molecular medicine. So the the major, the main empowerer of this is sequencing the complete human genome. Have you guys heard about that? Right? It was, it's been a couple years already, but the complete human genome has been sequenced. So they know the nucleotide arrangement of the complete human genome. And there's billions of base pairs. And so all of the sequence, each letter in, that, in those billions of nucleotides, that sequence, that specific sequence is known at this point. Now there is variation between different humans, but not much. And there's not much variation between us and an ape. So if you sequence our genome and, the, and look at you know, chimpanzees' genome, there's um, a few percent. I mean, I think somewhere between one and three percent difference. So that's pretty profound. Oops, that's kind of humbling. <laughs> Um, so we really are related to our, um, to those other features that look a lot like us. Just why they make those.